Let's speak for a moment about bivocational church planting or what we call tent making. Of course, the term tent making comes from the Apostle Paul, who uh, supported his own ministry by being a tent maker. Um, in other words, he had a secular job which provided for his, his you know, his uh, sustenance, but um, he, they, he then, in his time when he wasn't working, was devoted to ministry. And so many church planters today are bivocational church planters. They have secular jobs. They support themselves. And in fact, many have advocated this as, again, one of the best ways to really have church reproduction, to advance church planting more rapidly. We just don't have money to pay enough church planters to go and plant churches. That would just be way too slow. And so we need to mobilize people who can be self-supporting. Um, in fact, um, this is quite common in many places, more in the majority world, where uh, the, the ministers know that even pastors of established churches may not receive enough money from their church to support themselves, that they have to have some kind of a job on the side. And uh, I was uh, teaching at a Bible school in Thailand, and um, their, their goal was that half of these graduates from their Bible school would be self-supporting missionaries that would go to other countries in Southeast Asia. And to do that, they didn't have money to say, well, we will send you money every month so you can sustain yourself. These missionaries that were going to be going, and we were in Thailand, but they were going to be going to Laos or Cambodia, southern China, they were going to have to support themselves. And so even in that Bible school, they had vocational training. They were learning animal husbandry, or they were learning how to do fisheries. Um, most of them would be going to rural areas where those would be the kind of skills they would need to be able to support themselves financially and live, but at the same time to be evangelists, church planters. So uh, this is not unusual. Now, sometimes it's more technical skills. They might be uh, teaching you a skill like computer programming or, or other uh, skills that will help you get a job wherever you go. I know of one uh, place in Southeast Asia where copy shops uh, they opened uh, photocopy shops and the pastors would run the photocopying shop. It's not that difficult of a job. You can learn it fairly easily and uh, you could earn enough money then to support your family, but then you'd have your pastoral ministry. So the idea of bivocational church planting or tent making is another sort of type of church planter. Now, that might be a pastoral church planter or it might be a, an apostolic church planter. But the main idea is that you're supporting, you're financially supporting yourself. I know of one missionary who uh, was feeling called to go to the Muslim world in a place where uh, virtually nobody would get in on a missionary visa of any kind. And what he did was he did some research and found out if you want to get a visa as an expatriate to go to this country, you had to be a, learn the, the skill of stone cutting. Um, so they had gems, and so how do you cut diamonds, and how do you polish uh, precious stones, and so on. He literally, although he'd, he'd been to seminary, had a theological education, he went to vocational school to learn how to be a stone cutter, so he could get a visa to go to this country, and then he would work as a stone cutter. But of course, then he would be sharing his faith and uh, doing evangelism. So the advantages of tent making are pretty straightforward. For one, it doesn't cost a lot of money. In other words, the advance of the gospel is not dependent on somebody raising money for a salary and, and all those kinds of expenses. Um, and that tends to be one of the real limitations. We're always saying, well, we don't have enough money. We don't have money to pay somebody to do this. The low expense. Another advantage of tent making is the natural relationships that you have in a community by working. Now, especially if you have something like a photocopy shop, you've got people coming in and out all day long. And so you're meeting people in the community in a natural sort of way. Sometimes a professional paid church planter enters the community. He meets uh, somebody and then they say, well, you know, what's your occupation? And the person says, well, um, I'm a pastor. 
And they go, well, where's your church? <laughs> oh, well, it doesn't exist yet. And people go, hmm, that sounds very strange. And immediately, you're kind of a suspicious person. Well, if I'm there and I run a photocopy shop, it's obvious that's my job, a photocopy shop. And also, sometimes when somebody's paid, say it's a national person in, in India or, or Russia, wherever you are, and uh, people say, oh, well, so you're a pastor here, but there's no church. What do you live on? Who, who's giving the money for this? Well, then if you say, well, there's this group of people in America that are sending money for me to do this, they go, hmm, so the Americans got some kind of an agenda going on here. The Americans are trying to influence here. We don't think that's a good idea. And your credibility goes like that. I was once in India talking to Indian church planners, and many of them were receiving their, their salary from the United States. And they said, you know, sometimes people come up to us and they say, how much did the Americans pay you to do that? <laughs> in other words, they didn't really believe that those people were sharing the gospel because of a conviction. They said, well, this is your job. Somebody's paying you to do this. Or they said, we don't have credibility in the community because people don't know where to put us. They, they don't know what to do with us because we're pastors of a church that doesn't exist and this is a Hindu place. And they said, we need to have some kind of occupational skill so that people respect us. They don't respect us. So you'll have to know what is respectable and what's not respectable in the community wherever you are. Maybe you're in China or maybe you're in Uzbekistan or, 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 or Germany or someplace. You need to know what the credible kind of occupations are going to be and um, how that is going to affect your ability to minister. But when you have a secular job in the community, you have natural relationships. I think I mentioned before that I myself had been a tent maker in the first church plant I was directly involved in leading. I had just graduated from seminary. My wife had also gone to seminary. She was graduating. We began to look for opportunities for ministry. We knew we wanted to be church planters as missionaries overseas, and we were told, well, you plant a church first in the United States, and then we'll see if we'll send you to do it somewhere else. We thought, okay, if that's what you say. So we went and we started a church plant um, in the Chicago area. Well, there was no money to pay for a church planter to do that. But the Lord had, he knew this all along because a year earlier, as my wife was finishing her studies, I'd gotten a secular job in this particular town, the suburb of Chicago. I already had a job there. And then the door opened up to plant a church in that town. So I already had a job there. God was very good. And so we moved there. I had a job. And so for the first, roughly the first year, I had a 40 hour a week job working for a steel company. And then eventually the church was able to pay me half time and then full time. But I was able to build some relationships through that. And um, it also gave me some credibility in the community. And so being a tent maker will, in some contexts, give you a better relationship and a better ability because people don't second guess your motives. You're sharing the gospel not to earn money. You're sharing the gospel because it's your inner conviction. And another great thing about being a tent maker is you can be an example to other believers. Now, I just got through saying that one of the things you want to be doing is empowering local lay people to do ministry. Now, what sometimes happens is a lay person will say, now, wait a minute. You're paid to do this. Nobody's paying me to do this. And I've got to work a job. I've got a family. Where am I supposed to find time to do the kind of things you're doing? And that's understandable. Many people are working not a 40-hour week job. They're working 50 hours or 60 hours. They're moonlighting. They're trying to find a way to, to, to make a living. And then I come along and say, well, you ought to spend so and so many hours a week to prepare a sermon. And they say, how am I supposed to do that? Well, if you're a tent maker, if you have a job, a secular job, and you can still do ministry over and above what you're doing in your secular job, 
You can say, look, if I can do it, you can do it. And so you can be an example to people, not only of how to do ministry in addition to having a secular job, you can also be an example of what it means to be a Christian in the workplace. See, many times, especially if you're evangelizing people who are new believers, they don't have many Christian role models. They say, you know, what does it mean to be a Christian in the workplace? Well, see, if I also have a job, I can, I can be a role model and say, here's how I deal with these kinds of issues. I was very glad for that year that I was working full-time at the steel company. I began to, to understand the workaday world, the challenges, the compromises that are sometimes expected of you. Sometimes people are working in situations where they're asked from their employer to do things that a Christian would not want to do. How do you deal with those issues? How do you be a person of integrity in the workplace? So there's many ways that the tent-making church planter can be an example to the people in the church they're planting. And then, as I mentioned already, many times the only way that a church planter will be able to enter a community that's restricted is by having some kind of a job skill um, to open a business uh, that would allow them to live in that community. Of course, we're thinking of restricted communities in the Muslim world, uh, many countries that are just closed to any kind of missionary activity. Um, and so the person has to have some kind of a job that gives them a right to be in that community. Um, and they, otherwise, they just simply would not be allowed to live there. So uh, the tent-making approach has been one that's been tried. This is nothing new. Um, most of the earliest in the first centuries of the church, there were relatively few paid uh, missionaries to go share the gospel and plant churches. Most of them were, were people who, like Paul, were tent makers. Some of them were soldiers who were moved from place to place. Uh, they, were, they were business people who did business in other parts of the world and naturally shared their place. Some were even slaves, like Patrick, uh, St. Patrick in Ireland, a slave that had been brought to Ireland. He escaped. He actually en ended up going back. Um, and so there are very many ways that, that God moves people around, and uh, secular occupations are one of them. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS Seminary's database, please visit tvsseminary.com. However, there are disadvantages to being a tent-making church planter. Like I say, I've experienced this myself, and I've observed this in many, many situations. So it's not the cure-all, it's not the answer for every problem. For example, you're going to have less time for ministry. If you've got a job that's demanding, you come home from work tired at the end of the day. And especially if you're running your own business, anybody knows who's tried to start their own business, you're going to put in a lot of hours. It's hard to make a go of it if you're running your own business. And so you're going to have less time to do ministry in the sense of spending a lot of time with people, uh, building relationships with non-Christians outside of the workplace, uh, training people. We've talked about you want to be training others to do work. Um, you're going to have less time. That's just a reality. The progress, partly because of that, is going to be slower. Now, you have a lot of natural relationships, which is good for evangelism, but you do have less time to be working with believers, and so it's usually going to be moving a little slower. And one big one is if you are a cross-cultural church planter, where you have to go into a, a place where you're going to learn a new language, many times people will go in and they say, well, I'm going to uh, run this business and I'm just going to use English or some other language. Well, then where are they going to find time to learn the language well? If you've ever tried learning a foreign language, it's, it's one thing to sort of have a functional ability to speak another language, just to kind of live and get things done. It's a whole other level of language proficiency to be able to minister, to be able to preach, to be able to counsel people who have personal questions and problems. You really need to really be quite proficient at the language. And my observation is that for cross-cultural workers who say, I'm going to go in as a tent maker, and they just start right out with, say, a secular job, they don't have the time 
to devote to just learning the language well. And sometimes they never do. And that becomes a major handicap for them. And so I've often recommended it if a person is going to go in as a tent making church planter and it's a place where they need to learn another language or even another, just another culture, you need to be spending time, just take a year as a language student. And a year is usually not enough, but it's certainly better than nothing. And so take the first year, support yourself, raise sport, whatever, become a student, get a student visa, just learn the language, learn the culture. Then you can get your job. Then you can be uh, working 40 hours a week at something else and doing ministry on the side. But if you don't even know the language well, you're working 40 hours a week and then you've got to somehow communicate with the local people and disciple people and train, you're going to, it's, it's gonna be like running with lead shoes. It's gonna be like being handcuffed because language is going to be your primary ministry tool. You've got to get the language. And you've got to understand the culture. And so um, if you are going to be a church planter in a location where you need to learn the culture and the language, that's going to be important. And by the way, don't underestimate the importance of learning the local culture, even if it's the same language, even if it's in the same country. You may be from the northern part of the country, but the people in the south have a very different culture. They may speak a slightly different dialect that's a little harder for you to understand. They may have a different lifestyle, different values. And you need to be willing to adapt to that. And sometimes it's easier to adapt to a radically different culture. Say if a European goes into Japan, they know that's a different culture. They're going to have to change almost everything. But it's sometimes a lot harder for a person to go to a different subculture even within their own nation. I think of Germany here when uh, 1990, early 90s, when Germany was reunified, Eastern Germany, Western Germany became one country. Well, they'd been separated for 40 years and very different ideologies, very different lifestyles, standard of living, so on and so forth. Educational systems, very different. And there were some pastors from West Germany who'd been very effective as pastors. They went over to East Germany after reunification and they made no adjustments. They thought they could just minister the same way they used to minister in the West. And they found resistance. They weren't relating to the people very well. They didn't adjust to the different mentality. They didn't understand the life, life situation of the people there very well. They ran into, some of them ran into some big problems. So don't underestimate cultural differences even moving within a subculture. And then of course there's pressures on the family. You're working a full-time job, or maybe it's even just a part-time job. Then you're trying to work in the church, and then you're trying to counsel somebody who has an issue in the church. You're trying to train up new leaders. Where's family life? One of my doctoral students did a study of tent-making church planters in Brazil, and effective ones. And he found out many of these things. They had more credibility. In fact, they were much more respected. Some of them have very good jobs. And so they were respected in the community, and, and people would listen to them when they'd share the gospel because they were respected people, maybe a medical doctor, an engineer, a school teacher. But there were tremendous pressures on the family. They could get phone calls at any time. The weekends were full with church-related things. And so there can be tremendous stress because you're, you're trying to do so much in a limited amount of time. And then the tent maker sometimes has less accountability. In other words, if somebody's paying you to be a church planter, well, you answer. You're accountable to whoever's paying you to be that church planter. But if you're just sort of your own boss, you've got your own job, you're doing your own work, sometimes there's not that same level of accountability. And so I recommend that if a tent maker should be affiliated at least with some kind of a fellowship of churches or maybe some other pastors, um, if it's a mission organization, um, that helps you be accountable, that gives you counsel. There's people you can go to that are praying for you and helping you solve problems and so on, so that you're just not out there totally working alone on your own. Sometimes tent makers are like that. They're just out there, they get this job, they go and then they're just gonna do it. But then they don't have coaching, they don't have counsel, they don't have accountability, and that's difficult. And then there can also be conflicts of interest. Do I give more time to my business? Do I give more time to my church? 
Is earning money my real motivation for being here? Or is ministry my real motivation for being here? And uh, sometimes that can lead to conflicts of interest. Well, what I'll do is I'll read now a few application questions and then I'll take some questions that you have because some of these concepts are probably pretty new for you. But for those of you, especially the distance learners who are watching, think about these questions for what this means for your ministry. Of the various types of church planters, the pastoral, the catalytic, the apostolic, which do you think is the most appropriate for your context and why? Which type of church planter fits your personal gifts and passions. Not everybody's made to be a pastor. Not everybody's made to be an apostle sort of church planner. Not everybody's gifted to be catalytic. And then finally, what are the advantages or disadvantages of tent making in your context? How effective are tent makers? How easy is it for someone to get a job like a tent maker? And so on. So you may want to discuss those and think about what that means for you.